Hello everybody, how are you? We're back again with another, another Omaha video. Omaha, our featured community this week. And this time we're all the way up to the 20th century. Yay, the 1900s. And now at this point, Omaha has gone through what I call the teenage years of the 1800s and is now exploding. Uh, the population's increasing, the industry's increasing, the construction's increasing. It's becoming a modern city, and right in the middle of it, right at the beginning of the 1900s, unfortunately, there was a major kidnapping case. A local meatpacking boss's son was kidnapped for ransom. Now, what's inter interesting about that case is that the kidnappers didn't want money. They wanted uh, some uh, a boxcar of uh, porterhouses, a boxcar of T-bones, a boxcar of New York strips, and a boxcar of rump roast. That was their um, demand. And then also, of course, as in all growing uh, industries around the world, there was strife between labor and management in factories, in meatpacking districts, in the railroads, all over. It's just the natural, um, but you know, a lot of times in those days, uh, strikes got out of hand and um, you know, the empl employees though are demanding what all employees uh, generally demand and that's good working conditions, better pay, now, sometimes they went a little crazy. You know, it would be Valentine's uh, month, right? It would be February. And some of these employees are demanding, I demand a box of chocolates and flowers every day of the month through the 14th. Uh, and come on now. Uh, any, any good labor negotiator would say, uh, come on now. What are you talking about? Uh, sometimes during the 4th of July, uh, right in those few weeks leading up to Independence Day, workers would be demanding bottle rockets, okay? Uh, black cats, uh, um, what they call uh, tongue depressors. All of these are fireworks of different kinds, and sometimes, even if you're a patriotic worker and you want to display that on the 4th of July, you really can't demand that as part of a labor negotiation to have all of these fireworks, especially, and who knows what was going on at the time, but especially in states where it's illegal. Now, that, now the, the problem is sometimes workers demand all these fireworks, and let's be honest, some of them are closer to uh, armaments and munitions than they are than they are to uh, harmless firecrackers. Uh, they're, they're so loud and so big and so explosive, they make the uh, hair on your uh, arm stand up when they go off, and it make you jump out of your seat. But nonetheless, you also have the, the need to travel to, to get some of these firecrackers. You have to go all the way down to Texas. Now, are you trying to tell me that in a labor negotiation, workers should be able to demand firecrackers and fireworks of such, of such size and, and uh, firepower that management would have to get in the station wagon and drive all the way down to Texas, to the panhandle of Texas to buy these fireworks? or to the hills of Kentucky and drive all the way back to Omaha. I mean, it, it was just those kinds of things that made the labor negotiations during the 1900s so, uh, so full of strife and stress, okay? And then, then you also have the fact that there were tornadoes through much of that time period. Now, they have dialed down the tornadoes. The tornadoes are, even with climate change, have, have lessened because in those days they could dial up a tornado. I mean, it, it was the type of community where the power was so centralized that all they had to do was make a couple phone calls or a couple of uh, tippy taps on the Morse code and here comes a tornado. And uh, they didn't exactly wield uh, this kind of power with, uh, with justice, right? It was more of a uh, keeping down, well, going back to our earlier comment about the labor negotiations. A lot of times they're trying to keep down strikers. 
and keep strike breakers from getting mauled by strikers when they showed up on the line trying to cross the line. And, um, you know, they dial up a tornado and here it comes all of a sudden. And then there goes, um, you know, there goes the strike. So it wasn't, again, it was a rough and tumble uh, to era where you had the getting through the uh, teenage years of the 1800s now into the real, the real growth of the 1900s and onward. Okay. So some of the things that uh, were going on in, in that time period is that Omaha, believe it or not, it wasn't Nashville, I'll give you that, it was New Orleans, but there was a growing and exploding uh, music scene during that time period, okay? And a lot of these uh, bands and groups uh, were known around the uh, country, including the uh, Missouri Whitecaps, now, the Missouri Whitecaps, uh, it was kind of a joke about their name because the Missouri honestly didn't have Whitecaps. But they uh, toured around the country as a barbershop quartet and were pretty well known because, mainly because of a couple of big hits. And it's just like any other music act. You go for the hits and they try to work in a lot of their old stuff. and uh, or, or even worse, they try to work in some of their new stuff that nobody in the audience really cares about. They're just like, play the hits and, uh, you know, sit down. So uh, they had they had one song, I uh, I have Council Bluffs in my heart for you, and then another one from from Muskogee to down to Missouri, right into your heart, and those are two of their big hits. And they used to tour around, uh, and they'd come back to Omaha for big dates. So for example, in the spring, they'd hit all the high school proms. And they were making big money back then. It was, you know, 50, 60 bucks. But in those days, uh, that was a lot of money. The problem is they had to split it between all four of the white caps. And, uh, you know, they'd get 10 bucks here and there. So they weren't, they weren't making a lot of money, but they were on the road. And uh, they had all of the benefits of being on the road in terms of um, seeing the world, traveling, expanding their horizons. Uh, and learning what bed bugs are up close and personal when you get to uh, Toledo, Ohio, and you have to stay in a bed bug infested, um, you know, uh, bed bug infested flat house because the Holiday Inn where you made the reservations suddenly can't find uh, suddenly can't find your reservation simply because you made a song about them that was in some eyes, uh, was not as friendly as it might have been for a hit song, but there's nothing you can do about that. It's part of being in a popular music group. Uh, now, so up through the middle of the century, then, the, you know, the industry that really grew in those days was the insurance industry. And that, much like Des Moines, Iowa. Des Moines, Iowa is the center of a lot of insurance. And, and, and you may have heard of a company called Mutual of Omaha, and it was uh, firms like that that uh, were starting to establish themselves in Omaha because, for one, you had this no-nonsense Midwestern approach that a lot of people that a lot of people appreciated. So, so that's why financial uh, institutions often blossomed in the Midwest is because people would put their money in a bank where they didn't think you were full of baloney. You know, you, you get to some of these cities. Like, like, for example, if you had, uh, let's say, a million dollars, would you put that in a bank that was uh, located in, let's say, Philadelphia? Uh, no. <laughs> you know, you know that they're just going to gamble away that money with trips down to, at that time, they could gamble in Cuba. They could go to, uh, Vegas wasn't quite a thing yet, but they could go to the south of France. They could go to uh, Asia Minor, where there was a lot of gambling halls. And that's what the Philadelphia types would do with it. And all of a sudden, your money's gone. Or they put it into a new Cadillac Eldorado, and they're cruising around the streets of Philadelphia in what was your money. So what you want, and at least in those days, where you'd want to put your money is in a staid, steady, boring city like Omaha, because you know the uh, founders and owners are going to keep your money safe and they're not going to be buying Cadillac Eldorados and driving around Omaha waving at people from the candy-colored car, right? 
So that is why insurance companies became big there and Mutual of Omaha then started that TV show, which everybody knows, which every week featured wildlife in different, uh, from different parts of the world th that were in bowling tournaments. And you haven't lived until you've seen an American eagle grip a bowling ball in its giant talons. You don't really realize how big they are until you see it on TV and rip a bowling ball down the lane for three strikes in a row to win almost a perfect game and more importantly, beat the gibbon monkey that he was playing against uh, in the final rounds of a tournament on the Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, a bowling, bowling tournament show. So that was an important part of the growth of the early days of the entertainment business in Omaha as well. So then on to the 70s and, uh, you know, 80s and what, what was still happening? Tornadoes. Now, they weren't dialing them up on demand like they used to, but they would still occur. And a major tornado hit in the 70s as well as a major blizzard in the 70s as well. And sometimes they would happen at the same time. Now, if you've ever been in a tornado that's in the middle of winter, in other words, a blizzard tornado, some call them blizzado, blizzados, uh, some people call them blizzados, and some, uh, some other people call them tornizards. All right, so they really had both names. They hadn't really settled on names by that time, and it just depended on what region of Omaha you're from. But if you, whether you called it a, a tornizard or a... Um, a blizzado, it just didn't, it depended on where you're from. And so in other words, it's a tornado in the middle of winter. Well, guys, uh, that's a whole new level of destruction and freezing temperatures that you don't want to ever experience for the rest of your life. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes life was so slow. We talked about the benefits of a slow, steady pace of life in Omaha, but now sometimes the youth of the town found this way too slow. And that's why you had a lot of tattoos starting to happen in the 70s, but also some of these thrill seekers in Omaha, the youngsters, usually guys, young, you know, crazy guys, and some girls, some crazy girls, would get out their, uh, get out their uh, skis and they would ride the blizzard. They'd ride the tornado blizzard, the tor bliss, the the uh, the tor the tornard, <laughs> the tornard or the blizzado. Blizzado sounds a little has a little more flow. They would ride the blizzado on their skis. So you'd look out your window, and, and here are these crazy crazy neighborhood kids riding the winds. Okay, using their skis as a, sort of a sail uh, at a hundred miles per hour, flying around the neighborhood, and uh, yeah, you couldn't tell from your living room window if that was a look of terror on their face or a lick, uh, look of total bliss from finally being free of the boredom of their life in Omaha. It was uh, very difficult to tell. So that went up through the seventies, and then as you went into the eighties and stuff. People looked around and they go, you know, we got to start. Uh, we got to start preserving some of our lifestyle here. We got to. We have to have parklands and and historic places that we can give to the coming generation, so they they can look back and go, what the hell were you doing in Omaha? You know, why didn't you at least go to St. Louis? And so we have to have buildings and um, places of monuments and things that we can point to and say, well, this is why we stayed. And uh, they may or may not agree. You know, they may look back and go, well, I would have gotten in the car right away and driven to at least St. Louis or maybe even Topeka. Um, you know, but nonetheless, there was a push to start to preserve some of the important buildings and monuments of uh, Omaha and that was a successful, um, successful th thing. And now you can go there. You can go some of the, you can see the old uh, Omaha uh, Rogers family home from the early 1800s is still there. And of course the uh, original Rogers family from downtown, that was the first family before TV of the of Mr. Rogers neighborhood, the original. Uh, now it wasn't, a, it turned out to be a different Rogers family. And uh, they had a kind of a different take on 
Mr. Rogers neighborhood because the original Rogers family back in Omaha in the early 1800s that has been preserved, they had uh, a weekly play that they put on called Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. And uh, the kids from all around the uh, city would come in and watch them put on the play from the front porch of their house. Again, that house is still there. You can see it in the old district of um, Omaha, just north of downtown. And they'd put on a weekly play known as Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. And he'd come up. Now, instead of wearing, uh, you know, slippers, he'd put on his heavy winter boots. And it didn't matter if it was summer or winter, but that was part of the gag. He'd put on these heavy winter boots that you needed to uh, use in those days to get through a an Omaha winter. And of course, during the weekly play, or at least it wasn't so much a, a play as a monologue that this character, uh, Old Man Rogers, would put on and make the kids from the neighborhoods laugh. And uh, that was what they called entertainment back in those days. So that home is still there. And if you pay them uh, 100, 125 bucks, they'll let you uh, put on your own show on the same porch. And then you can uh, video record that, of course, on your phone or on your Apple smartwatch and then throw it up on throw it up on the gram or YouTube or maybe both. It depends. Uh, or if you're an old uh, school uh, millennial, you might even put it up on Snapchat. And then, of course, now they're getting requests to make TikToks uh, from that same porch. It's both a throwback and uh, you know, there is a feeling of among some of management of the old house that they're making fun of uh, the the Mister the old Rogers home, but you know they figure, hey, we'll take some we'll take some sh shots from people if it if it keeps the old Rogers home going, and also if it uh, gets the word out there on social media. So, guys, that is really an amazing uh, you know time in Omaha history. And in the next video, we'll look at the current day and find out what is happening in Omaha that is really exciting the town and getting more notoriety for this important, um, you could say, you could say this important foundational city, uh, really a cornerstone of the growth of the West. Because you have to remember, as an example, Omaha was the really the headwaters of the original railroad that had it when they went to do a trans-Pacific, transcontinental overland route. Where did they start that railroad? They started it in Omaha and it ran all the way to the Pacific Ocean and opened up the United States for the greatest westward expansion of any country in the history of the world. So guys, remember, this is a parody video. All of these details I've made up off the top of my head. So don't use this information in your master's thesis or in, in a uh, college level um, senior thesis or any kind of schooling because it's just not going to be anything useful that you'd be able to use. Okay, I hope that helps.